My name is Walter Peters, and um, I'm a naked Forex trader. So what that means is, oh my goodness, that's an ugly chart. What that means is my charts don't normally look like that. They actually look more like this. Um, and I trade off of um, simple price patterns off of reverse uh, support and resistance zones. So basically I look for the market to go to places where it tends to turn around and then I wait and see if it looks like it will turn around there. Uh, also, um, the other way to trade it is you go to a place where the market tends to turn around and see if it actually breaks through that. So it's simple trading systems. Um, many of you are familiar with the book called Naked Forex. There's a lot of those systems in that book. Uh, it's especially good for people who are unfamiliar with these concepts. So it's really good for people who are new to trading. Um, and what we're going to talk about today is not only some of the trades that are in the uh, in the market, and, and I'll, I'll take your questions for sure. But in the beginning, I want to talk about the main topic today, which are which is the seven ways that we can avoid losing trades. So another way of saying that is there's seven things that we often do as traders. We may not think about it, but what ends up happening is we we're, we're not helping ourselves out. We end up losing more than we need to simply because um, we're, not, we're, we're not approaching it in, in the most efficient manner, basically. So let's talk about all seven of these, and let's get started. The first one, and actually the best example of this, is a recent trade this week. No, not that one. It was this one. Was it Pound Aussie or Pound Cat? I think, let me go to uh, a different profile, guys. I'm on the wrong one. One second. It was a pound Aussie. Yeah, okay. All right, so this one came up um, earlier in the week. And basically, people were asking about um, this trade right here, this setup right here. Actually, it was even better was this one right here. No, Monday was this one. So we've had several, actually. But Monday was this one right here. Now, people were saying, look, and I agreed, look, the market's reversed here recently and fell, came back up, and then it printed, at, on this day right here, it printed this uh, kangaroo tail. Now, on Monday, this was Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Yeah, we're on Friday. So on Monday... So Friday, this kangaroo tail printed, and people were wondering, well, what, what, what should we do? And I said, yeah, it looks pretty good. So normally what we would do on one of these trades is we could manage it like this. The stop loss goes above the high. So let's go ahead and put that on there. Stop loss goes right here. Boom. Right? And our um, target, so that's the stop, this red box. And our target's probably going to be this area here where these highs are. See where, that, where the market's... I'll draw a line there. Right there. Right there. Boom. Um, this would have been the target. And um, the entry price... Now, this is critical. And this is, brings us up to the number one point about avoiding losing trades. Entries on a retrace will always equal a lower win rate. Now let's let's talk about that for a second. What do we mean by entries on a retrace equals lower lower win rate? Entries on a retrace equals lower win rate. What does that mean? So in other words, if we don't enter on a retrace, we will have a higher win rate and we will avoid some losing trades. So what happened here was the market printed King Retail on Friday, and then I said on Monday, people were asking me about this uh, at another webinar, actually, and they said, should we take it? And I said, I'm happy to take this trade if the market trades lower than the King Retail low. I said, however, if the market keeps trading higher and higher during the Asian session as it was, because it gapped up, it absolutely gapped up on the open. See, it closed here on Friday at 153.15, it gapped up and it opened at 53.46. That was a nice big gap. And so the question was, 
is the market going to trade up to where the stop loss would have been before it takes up the low down here? Because if it does that, it's game over for me and I don't take the trade. Now, a lot of traders probably took this trade on the basis of this previous top over here and the fact that the market started to show some wicks. You can see it another king retail here, another long wick here. This candle was just wicky all around. And then you had this king retail. So you, people are thinking, well, I'll just get in cheaper here. Well, guess what? You're absolutely right. You will get in cheaper if you, instead of having, you see, I would have, on this trade, I would have had a risk of approximately 140 pips. Now, I could have halved that by getting in during the agent session had a risk of about 70 pips, right? If I would have got in, gotten in in the agent session. However, however, the problem is that the market went higher and would have taken out the stop. So the trade is busted right here on the very first day. In fact, if it didn't get stopped out here, it certainly got stopped out on the next day right here, two days later right here. So it ends up being a losing trade. Now, you were always going to have a higher reward to risk ratio if you get in on a retracement. However, I don't like them necessarily. I do occasionally take them, but it's very rare. And I'm much more likely to do exactly what I did this week, which is on Monday I said, sure, I'm willing to take this trade. However, if my order is never hit down here, it's never hit, I'm not going to take this trade. And it was never hit, and I, of course, avoided a losing trade. So that's number one. One way to avoid losing trades is simply to wait for the market to make a new high or a new low to trigger your trade. Yes, your stop loss is going to be further away. Yes, you're going to have to make more pips to get a better reward to risk ratio. But yes, also, your win rate is going to go up. Because if I'm going to get stopped out here, the market has to go up, right? If I'm going to get stopped out, it has to go up. Now, it could still go down, trigger me into the trade, and then go up and stop me out. That's absolutely possible, and in that, in that case, both traders get stopped out. The retracement trader, who gets in at a cheaper price and waits for the price to go against him before getting in, he gets stopped out, but also the more conservative trader like me, I also get stopped out if that happens. But that's actually not as common. It's much more common to see exactly what happened here, which is the market just goes one direction and takes out that stop before the entry price. That's why I like to have entries on a sell stop. This is called a sell stop. When you say the market's got to go lower to trigger a sell trade, you call that a sell stop. And the reverse of that, of course, is when the market has to go higher to trigger a buy, that's a buy stop. So that's basically the first point. Are there any questions about that? Any questions about number one, which is, you know, to avoid losing trades, we avoid retrace trades. We avoid getting in at a cheaper price. We instead wait for the market to tell us it wants to go down. When the market says I want to go down, then it triggers my trade here. And of course, that never happened. So I avoided a losing trade this week by sticking to this rule. Okay, cool. No questions? Excellent. Uh, MRC says, where, how many pips lower do you put it? Well, on this trade right here, you can see the low is 52.94. So 52.89, five pips lower is pretty good. I like five or six pips, you know. If it's a weekly chart, maybe it's 10 pips, but normally I like about five, six, seven pips, you know. If the spread's a little bit greater, maybe I, you know, maybe I do seven pips, but usually it's about five pips lower, yeah. So on this trade right here, I think my order was at, the low was at 52.94. I think I actually had it at 52.89, I believe. Yeah. All right. Good question. Uh, Ian says, would you have entered on the last? No. Oh. All right. So here, let me just show you. Um, here, let me show you something. Because we have some questions here. Okay, so my entry order is right here with this red boxes. Let me make it green. First of all, let me get rid of this this red line here. Okay, I'll just move it up. So this is my entry order right here, and it's going to be green for go, get in, trade. I generally 
will wait a day, guys, or one candle. So one daily candle. So if it doesn't go on the first day, I generally won't take the trade. Sometimes I'll wait, let it slide to the second day. You can see here, my, my order's right here, right? It never gets triggered. I could have that order still in my platform, and it still wouldn't be triggered. Look. One day, never gets there. Two day, never gets there. Three day, never. It just went the opposite direction. In fact, this itself was another trade where you take, when a kangaroo tail doesn't work out, you can just take the opposite. And, and it's called a busted kangaroo tail or a broken kangaroo tail. So this trade is never was never, ever triggered. Even if I waited till today, it still wouldn't have been triggered. It still wouldn't have been triggered. Okay? Now, Let's talk about number two. Number two way to avoid losing trades is has everything to do with your thinking. Think to win. What do I mean by think to win? Well, positive thoughts beget positive experiences. What normally happens, and I'm no different from anyone else, it's it, when you get into a losing streak, you start to get a little bit negative and you get down on yourself. I found it much better to put yourself in a positive frame of mind. And there are lots of ways to do that. The simplest way, um, and this is where uh, being a psychologist helps, because <laughs> one, one of my professors early on in, in schooling, he was, a, he was known for studying mood. And does anyone here know what you can do to improve your mood? What's the best thing you can do? If you want to put yourself in a better mood, what's the simplest thing you can do? Any ideas? Get up. <laughs> Smile. Win. <laughs> Move around. Laugh. Pan on fire is really good. That's good. Laugh. Laugh, says Colin. Mish says laugh. Christy says uh, change attitude. Uh, 20 minutes of exercise, says Lucas. Hey, Lucas and Pan on fire are right on track. Um, this guy... This professor, who was quite famous, and in the United States, they would often, when he did his research, he would often get a press release that would go out into the it, into the major newspapers and 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 um, news outlets. It would get released, which is quite rare, actually. Most scientists don't get their information out. Most scientists are huddled up in a corner studying some little part of humans or biology or whatever it is, medicine, and, and their research is never, you know, no one knows about it. It doesn't happen. It doesn't get out. Word never travels. But for this guy, because it was interesting research, it did actually get out. And every time he did a study, he found that um, he couldn't do better than this, which is as follows. If you want to put yourself in a good mood, you go on a 15-minute short, brisk walk. So 15 minutes means you're not going that far, really. Uh, and brisk means you're not, you know, strolling along or, you know, very slowly stepping. But you're actually, you act like you're going, like you're late. You're late for a meeting. You're late for something. You really got to get going. So you go on that brisk walk. That was, he found, the number one thing to, you can do to improve your mood. So what does this have to do with trading and thinking to win? Well, one of the things that we have to do as traders, if we're, if we're a little bit down, if we've had some losing trades, if we're in a drawdown, if things don't seem like they're going well, the first thing we have to do is we have to change our mood. That's the first thing. And the best way to do that, of course, is take, take a short, brisk, 15-minute walk. That is the number one thing. And he tried, this professor tried, I don't even know if he's still alive anymore, but he tried, probably not, he tried everything, everything he could think of to try and beat the short, brisk walk, and he could never beat it. It was the number one thing that you could do to improve your mood, and it was across the board, always, all ages, doesn't matter. So he would actually park his car when he went to work at the university. He would actually park his car further away from his office than he needed to because he wanted to go on that 15-minute walk. <laughs> he wanted to go on that 15-minute walk to work every day. Because uh, he wanted to be a good, in a good mood when he got to work. Um, yep, yeah, so there you go. So that's it. Um, <laughs> Sir Geos, you're making me laugh. You guys have some really good answers here. <laughs> but um, it's, it's true that those other things, the people here that have, are thinking about dirty things, those didn't beat it either. The best thing was the short, brisk walk, believe it or not. Believe it or not, it was number one. 
Okay, so what can we do when we want to think to win? Well, we need to think positive thoughts. So this is what I would encourage traders to do. When you're in a, in a poor mindset, what you can do is you can go on a short risk walk, and then when you get back, make a list of all of the reasons why you know you're going to be successful. Just a long list. And we're going to talk about things that you can put on that list later and one of the most important ones. But right now, the most important thing is that you're changing your thinking slowly. It doesn't have to be all at once. You, can't, you don't have to go from, oh my God, I'm down you know, 20% on my trading account to um, I'm going to be a billionaire next week. You don't have to change it that drastically. In fact, that's almost impossible to do. But what you can do is you can move a little bit up the ladder. So for example, if I say, oh, I've lost you know, seven losing trades in a row, um, how do I get myself in a better mood? Well, I go outside, I get some fresh air, I go on a short, brisk walk, come back, and I make a list, and I say, okay, what's one thing that I know about my trading that's good? Well, one thing is that, yeah, I have had seven losers now, but I've also had 12 winners in a row in the past. Or, yeah, I've, I've got a bit of a drawdown now, but I've, come, I've made more than 20% in the past. So it's possible for me to get out of this drawdown if I'm down 20%. I've made more than 20% in the past. It might take a couple months, but I can get out of this. Or you can say, I've been trading this trading system for three years, and this is the worst I've ever seen for this trading system. It's the worst I've ever seen. So it's probably not going to last, right? All drawdowns come to an end, one, one way or another. There are lots of things that you can write down. You can say, uh, um, you can take time away and say, well, yeah, it's true that my training's not going well now, but I'll take time away, and then when I come back, I'll feel refreshed. And I'll look at the charts anew because I haven't been watching the charts every day. So if I take a week off and come back and don't even look at the charts at all for a whole week, don't look at any news, anything about the financial markets, come back a week later, I will have a brand new, fresh perspective and everything will look so new to me. I will probably be more apt to interpret it the way I should rather than, you know, I'll trade what I see instead of what I think. Especially good for technical traders. So that's the number two thing we can do to avoid losing trades, is we can just change our thoughts. We can do it very slowly, very, very basic things we can do, but it, by changing our mood and changing our thoughts and writing down what's good about our trading, what's good about what we do, that's one way to get better. Number three, let's talk about number three now. And this is a biggie, guys. Number three, whoa, okay. I want to go to the next one now. Is, can everyone see that one? You should see a hand there. Oh, whoa, 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 whoa. We don't want to, we don't, we're going too fast here. There's a big hand right here. Uh, yeah, you can also use that, Christy. If that's your thing, you can use that too. You can definitely do that. All right, the second thing is to trade little. What do I mean by trade little? Trade little means take a smaller risk percentage. If you've been risking 2.5% on your account, what about risking half a percent? And why is that important? Why is it critical to reduce the amount of risk on a trade? Well, funny things happen when we trade too much, okay? When, when we're trading, can you, can you see this? You should see my hand here, yeah? Does everybody see that? You should definitely see. Okay, cool. All right. If you're trading a smaller percentage, what that means is you will tend to concentrate on your trading rules. If we are trading a smaller percentage, the money at risk doesn't matter as much because we're used to trading more. When we're trading too much, what will tend to happen is we think in terms of dollars or euros or pounds or yen or whatever our, our currency is, rupees, whatever, whatever we're, our account is in, we think in terms of the profit on the table or the loss that's been realized, and we don't stick to our rules. If instead we stick to our rules, it's, it's, it's so much easier to apply our trading system if we're not thinking about the amount of money 
that's made or lost. And it's so much easier to dump a trade quickly and take a very quick profit instead of waiting for the full profit target when we have too much on, 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 the, on risk, too much risk on the table. If we have too much risk on the table, we're much more likely, likely to cut our winners and let our losers ride. <laughs> much more likely. So by trading a small percentage, what that does is it refocuses us and it refocuses us on our trading system and allows us to really hone in on the rules and applying the rules to the system. It's so much easier, guys, and this is a common problem. A lot of traders are probably trading too much. A lot of traders get stars in their eyes and they want to really ramp up an account when, in fact, by trading a smaller percentage, they can probably do better over the long haul. Yes, each trade is going to be worth less, and yes, each winner is going to be worth less, but Yes, also, you can probably pile those suckers up more quickly simply because you're more disciplined. Trading a small percentage. If you can't sleep at night because you have a trade on, it's way too much, right? It's way, way, way too much. This is particularly important for those traders who have a low win rate. If you have a low win rate, you can get beat into the ground by having so many losers and watching those pile up and take a big chunk out of your account. If you've got a 40% win rate, and so 60% of the time you're losing, it's really hard to do that if you're trading too much. It just eats at you. So I would encourage most traders, almost everybody here probably trades too much. If you trade, if you're risking on each trade, well, first of all, you should be risking the same amount on each trade. If somebody's risking 2.7% on one trade and 0.9% on another, that's a, that's a problem, right? So we got to start there. We got to make sure that we know what our risk is for percentage-wise on each trade, and then we're, we're using the same amount. But after that, the next thing to think about is, well, can we really reduce this, and should we reduce this? I would encourage you to just for one month reduce your risk in half and see what your results are compared to the previous month. So let's say this month you lose three percent overall for the whole month. Next month you reduce your risk in half and see if you actually do better than that. I would think you'd be surprised at what happens. I really do. Okay, let's keep going. <coughs> the next one, uh, so that's number three, trade little. Trade a smaller percentage risk, and that way we can um, manage our trades much better. The next thing is, and this is actually better um, applied by women traders than men in general. I hate to generalize, but overall, you will notice that most women are good at this and most men are not. Doesn't mean that we can't do it, fellows, fellas, guys, compadres. Um, but what it does mean is that we have to be aware of the fact that, you know, we, our genetics may be working against us here. And that is abandon ship is number four. It's not particularly useful for traders to dig their heels in and hold on to a trade and, and become very strong-willed when a trade goes bad. It's common for traders to add to losing trades. In other words, this is a perfect example on the pound Aussie. Pound Aussie went against us, so instead of letting the market hit our stop, now instead, let's say we got in here, okay, and instead of taking our 70 or 60 pip stop, we're now down 265 pips. And all along the way, we've shorted it and shorted it and shorted it. That would be awful, right? That would be an awful way to trade because now, instead of having one loss of 60 pips, we might have three positions. And the first position is down 260 pips. The second one's down 140 pips. Um, you know, all of that stuff. The other one's down 50 pips. And now we've got three losing trades instead of one. What will, and this is, this is sort of counterintuitive because in most things in life, you get rewarded for digging your heels in, for showing fortitude, for being strong-willed. You think about the businessmen who wouldn't say no and, and, and kept going against all odds and, and found a way to win. You know, those stories are all over the media, there's lots of books written about people like this, but unfortunately it doesn't work in trading. It just doesn't work. And that's why I have what I call the 78% rule. 
if the market goes 78% against me, I generally think about dumping the trade. I need a really good reason to stay in that trade. So, for example, if I had taken this, uh, the sell on the, on the pound Aussie, and, it, and of course my stop loss is all the way up here, but if it went 78% of the way to my stop loss, which means essentially somewhere around this area, somewhere around 54, 1.54, I would have dumped the trade, most likely. The only way I would have dumped the trade is if I looked at the one hour chart and I saw that the market looked like it was going to reverse. And if I saw that, then maybe I would have held it and been stopped out at the original stop. But m normally, I will get out of my trades earlier than the stop. If I see them, if, I, if I'm watching and, and I see them go against me, I'll normally get them out, uh, I'll get out faster. And what that means is I'll take more losing trades because some of them, of course, will turn around and go in the expected direction. And all those Gartley traders out there know about that. But for me, um, I'm okay having more losers knowing that my average loser is going to be smaller. And my average loser becomes smaller because I'm not taking the full stop every time. So that's number four. Abandoned ship. Females are much better at this and males are much have a much more difficult time. Female traders are, are not usually as wedded to their positions as men are. Men sort of get their egos tied up in their trading, and women overall tend not to. So they're better at this. Um, yeah, everyone has a stop, though, I hope. Yes, exactly. Sergio says, so that explains why women bail on men. <laughs> Maybe. I guess it depends on the man. <laughs> just like it depends on the trade. Okay, so um, if it just goes there, Mark, I, I, I get out of it if, it if it just goes there. It doesn't have to close up there, but if it just goes there. If I'm watching it and the market goes there, I, I, will, I will get out. Now, let's look at this. We can look at this one for an ex as an example. Um, let's just look at this one right here. I'm going to mark this candle from Monday. And what I want to do is see what the market did. Because um, I want to see. Okay, so here's the Asian session. It went up and then it fell. And then it kept going up. So if, if the market at this stage on this candle right here, this candle right here, if the market is still inching its way up like right here, I probably would get out right there on this candle right there. I might have even gotten out on this candle. However, that was the Asian session, and I expect the market to go in the wrong way. You know, I expected it to go up during the Asian session because I thought it might fall. Now when the market comes in here and it falls, you know, that's, that's a pretty good sign that perhaps, you know, it's going to go in my direction, but it never did. It starts inching its way up. And by the time the market got to this candle right here, to me, that was probably too far. Probably too much. Because at this stage, it had already broken 54 on this candle. It got to 54. So I might have got out here or here, but whatever. I didn't take the trade. It never triggered my, my order. But the, the important thing to note here is that if the market goes against us, we should be thinking about abandoning, abandoning ship. Um, Joseph says, how do I deal with these? I'm not sure I understand your question, Joseph. I'm not sure I understand your question. Your question. Please rephrase the question. Okay, number five. The next one is to get into uh, money management. And what I mean by getting, getting into money management? Well, we need to see the big picture in our trading, and we need to not get so down during drawdowns. Now, again, we've talked about mood. We've talked about thinking positive. There are tons and tons of books out there that you can get into about thinking positive. Um, I think Christy mentioned NLP. You can get into that, whatever makes sense to you. But the important thing, the very first thing you need to do when you're down in the dumps is improve your mood and the easiest way to do that is to go on a short brisk walk. From there we can change our thinking and start listing things that are positive about our trading. Now money management is about seeing the big picture and so it's not just about being down on yourself. It's about seeing 
how everything is interrelated in your trading. Money management is usually the last thing that comes in, right? Well, one of the last things. Trading psychology is usually the last thing that traders get interested in, but um, money management is right there with it. And what happens is traders get into two things. There's two aspects to money management. One is the question, am I going to blow up my account? And that gets, it gets into the risk of ruin. If you don't know anything about the risk of ruin, I'd encourage you to definitely look it up. There's lots of stuff on the internet about it. I've got stuff about it in my uh, daily trader course. Lots of stuff on money management. But the important thing for you guys to know right now is you need to know what your risk of ruin is. Based on your trading system, based on your win rate, your average winner, your average loser, what and the percent that you're risking, what is the likelihood that your account is blown up? That's very critical. The other aspect of this is a thing called optimal F. Now, you don't have to get into optimal F, but the basic idea of optimal F, it's related, uh, it's Ralph Vince has written lots of books about it. If you're not into math or statistics, I would encourage you to not read those books. But the basic idea is that there's a curve and there's a point of diminishing returns. Every trading system has a, 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 a percentage where if we trade that amount, that's, the, that's going to maximize the account. Now, I, don't, I can't think of any, um, I can't think of any reason why any trader would want to trade the optimal percentage um, for a trading system. And the reason why is because most traders would just not be able to sit through the drawdowns. It would be too painful. I don't know, if, I can't think of any instance where a trader would decide, okay, I'm going to trade the optimal um, risk percentage, the optimal F. The reason why is because you just won't stick with it. Nobody can stick with it. You would have to be incredibly strong-willed and have your psychology just lock, rock solid. Otherwise, you won't, you won't stick with an optimal F number. And the reason why is that the, the, it's a choppy ride. It's a very choppy ride. The only, the only, perhaps the only, only instance would be, let's say you've got $5,000 and you're thinking, uh, I'm going to go to Vegas and blow this on craps or blackjack or whatever your game of choice is. Or I'm going to throw it into a trading account and see if I can just really ramp it up. That's really the, about the only place and, you know, that I would say, okay, go for it. Go for optimal F. Most traders aren't going to be able to, they're not going to be able to suffer through that. It's just too, too painful. Um, optimal F is, in essence, well, we can, we can look it up here, but um, here, let me, um, let me see if I can get it for you guys. Here, hold on. I'll bring it up here. Optimal F um, I'll show you the best way to look at it is, is this so here is the this is the can everybody see this you should see my curve here yeah okay good yeah okay good so this is optimal F guys um, so you can see for this trading system and all all trading systems look the curve is exactly like this they're very, very similar. The only difference is how far it's shifted to the right or the left. So you can see for this training system, it looks like the optimal F was right around 2.5, or sorry, 25. So risking 25% of the account. Now, the problem is, as soon as you go beyond 25%, what that means is, um, as soon as you go a little bit too far beyond that, what that means is you're um, assured of eventually blowing up the account. So, in other words, if you're to the left of your peak on this curve, you're going to be okay. So, if I'm trading in, in this system, if I'm trading anywhere between you know 0.1% all the way up to 24.9%, I'm okay, and 25. Point it looks like 25% is the peak, so the, the trading account will be maximized by using that uh, amount of risk on each trade. Um, but as soon as I go beyond that, I'm assured of blowing up my account. Okay, 
So if I'm if I'm risking surprise surprise if I'm risking 80% of my account on every trade I'm going to blow it up. So that is op optimal F. Okay. Just want to make sure that you get the basic visual. That curve is going to apply to every trading system. Doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter whether you're using stochastics on the one minute chart or your naked trader on the weekly chart. Your chart your optimal F is going to look like that. It's just going to and they're usually I mean it depends on the win rate but. They're usually around 20%, 20-30%. Some systems are going to have an optimal F of 10%. Some are going to have one of you know 40, 30, 40%. But the point is, nobody should be trading optimal F. You shouldn't. But you should know what it is because it's related to your risk of ruin. And if you have, if you know what your optimal F is, you know how far you can push it. But really, nobody should be pushing that far. It just doesn't make sense. It doesn't make. I don't know why anyone would do that unless you you're just like a glutton for, for pain. You know, you love pain because you will experience pain if you use your optimal F. All right, that's number five. So getting into money management can help you avoid losing trades, especially when you understand risk of ruin and optimal F. Next, one thing that I would say um, for number six is this one applies to just about everyone, including myself. And I've learned this over the years, which is I need to wait. Number six is wait. If you can just wait one more candle, you got your trading system, it's firing off an alert, it's telling you you got to take a trade here. I know I got to go in here. I've got I've got a trade to take, but what if I wait one more candle? Why would I want to wait more one more candle because the market's going to tell me something. Every candle is a clue, guys. Every time that, as a naked trader especially, when I see a candle on the chart, it gives me a clue. Let's go back to our pound Aussie earlier in the week. Pound Aussie gave us a clue. The clue was, oh, let me get rid of this red red thing. The clue was, here's a kangaroo tail. I've printed this where I've reversed in the past. Maybe I'm going to fall here, but maybe not. And the clue was, by waiting one more candle, I saw, instead of getting in immediately on the kangaroo tail, I wait one more candle and I see, up. Oh, the market went up to the stop level and I knew. Knew right away that it was going to go up. It wasn't going to go down. It was highly, highly likely that it was going to go up because it busted through that stop level. And it's going to hold here. It held two days on top of the support here and then it rocketed right away. It went up, up, and away. So this is one thing that a lot of traders can apply to their trading simply by waiting one more candle. By waiting one more candle. Most traders are impatient. We don't wait long enough before entering a trade. We don't wait for one more clue from the market. That one more clue from the market can tell us whether or not we should get in that trade. Sure, sometimes it's going to go in our expected direction. We're going to have to get in at a worse price, but that's much better than getting in in a losing trade. So I would encourage most traders to just, right when you think you need to get in, just try and wait one more candle. If you're trading the hour chart, try and wait another hour. If you're trading the five minute chart, try and wait another five minutes. On the daily chart, like I like, I wait another day, and that helps me out so much. I can't think of an instance. I mean, sometimes it's going to really go, and you're going to just miss it, okay? It's no doubt. But most of the time, just waiting for that one more piece of information is going to help me put together the picture much better, and I'm going to know, okay, this trade's a good one, or no, no, no chance, no chance on this one. No way I'm going to take this, this risk. Um, number seven, and the last one, way to avoid losing trades. And of course, if you know me well, you know I'm a big fan of this, which is to test the living daylights out of your system. It's the single most important thing you can do to improve your confidence and withstand losing trades. Without testing, your likelihood of sticking with your system diminishes greatly, greatly. Because you're probably going to blame the market or you're going to blame the system. I'm going to say that in another way. People who blame the market for their losses or blame the trading system for their losses, in most cases, do not have an intimate knowledge of their trading system. If you haven't tested it, if you haven't sat through that system through many markets and seen what it looks like, you probably will be likely to say, one, the system sucks, it's broken, doesn't work anymore, or two, the markets have changed and this system doesn't work in this changed market. That is extremely common. Those two excuses for abandoning systems 
I believe, are related to the fact that the user of the system has not tested it. There are many trading systems out there that are brilliant, that will work, that will, that will make money for traders. However, the problem is in the trader. And if the trader doesn't have rock-solid confidence in the system because he's tested it, then it's unlikely he's going to stick with it. Okay, so I'm a big fan of manual testing, like Forex Tester. Um, you can email me. I can, you know, point you in the right direction. I think even FX Street can point you in the right direction. But uh, my email is WalterFXShake.com, and I can show you how I do it. Uh, some people use computerized testing. I'm not such a big fan of that because most people don't use computers to do their trading. Most people look at the chart and say, yes, I'm going to take a trade, or no, I'm not going to take a trade. So that's why I believe in testing with things like Forex Tester. Or you can just use MetaTrader. You can use MetaTrader and you can hit the F12 key, hit the F12 key, and, the, and, and write down your trades like this. So that's another way to do it. But testing is simply the best thing you can do to keep trading your system. It's the best thing you can do if you want to avoid going from system to system to system to system and changing your system like your underwear. It's the best thing to do, no doubt about it. <clears throat> um, pan, number one was don't enter on a retrace. Number one was enter when the market makes a new high or a new low. That was number one. Okay, so now I want to get into the questions here um, and also any charts that you want to look at. I'm happy to look at charts right now. Let's see what we've got going on. Mark says, in a previous webinar, you made a very interesting point about auto trading. You said that people who use auto trading don't let their systems run. I got all puffed up about that as I auto trade sometimes and until I realized it was true. <laughs> says Mark. It is true. And, and, um, I, I've been there, Mark. Believe me, I've been there. Um, auto trading, you know, using robots, EAs, whatever, it really only works if you just put them aside and let them rip. My favorite thing is to just break off a little bit of money, put it into it, and let it go. And just let it go. And don't just pay, log in once a week or once a month to make sure that everything's running smoothly. And that's it. Most traders are going to turn it off, though. And so what ends up happening is you have a semi-automated -auto system because instead of trading it uh, all the time, you do things like, oh, well, the NFP is coming up or the employment report or this or that, so I'm just going to turn off this system. Unless that's part of your rules, most trader, traders end up using discretionary trading through the automated system. Okay. Euro. Euro, euro, euro. Let's see. Uh, yeah, the euro, I'm waiting on the euro to get, this is my plan for the euro. I want it to get up around 20, uh, around 29.70. If it can get up to 29.70 and print a bearish candle, I'm going to sell. So on the euro, I'm, pl I'm playing this big box here. It's a last kiss trade. Market's going to come back up here, print a big red candle, and then I'm going to sell. So I'm still waiting on the euro to get up to here. That's 29.70. Big red candle, big bearish candle on the four-hour euro chart, and I'm going to sell. That's, that's what I think about the euro. Do I think it's going to go lower? Yes, but I, I want to wait for it to get up there and kiss that box. Um, pound. Yeah, pound's interesting. Uh, I think yesterday people were wondering about taking a buy on the pound and what I said was because it's on a brilliant level this is the 5216 level the thing about the pound is I'm worried it's going to break through this level and I thought that it might rock it up here and then fall back down what I will say though is if we get a double bottom here that would be worth a buy so if we get a big blue big bullish candle here especially some sort of engulfing candle um, I would be interested in a buy here but I, the way that it's looking like is it's looking like it's going to fall. And the reason I say that is because, see how we have these big red candles going down the daily? And then you have little tiny blue ones right here with long wicks. That's a hallmark of a downtrend retrace. In other words, the market's just doing this little tiny retracement and then it's going to, whoa, 
leg down. So if I had to guess, I would say the pound's going to go down. If I wanted to trade it on a daily chart, I would wait for a closing price, closing price below 52. Daily close below 52. What was the open here? The open on this one was 52.07. If I can get a daily close below this close over here, which was 52.07, so if it can close below 52 on the daily, I, that would be enough for me to sell it. I'll put a sell order below that low, a stop loss above this candle right here, target this level here at 50.80, and then the next level would be down here at 50, uh, 49. At 49, that would be 49. And that's that one right there. So that's the pound. I do think it's going to fall. I don't think it's going to give us a nice four hour double bottom. Could be wrong. It could all of a sudden print a really nice kangaroo tail or a big shadow here, but I don't think it's going to happen. I actually think it's going to break through and go lower. And it, it, in, in some ways, it looks like what the Aussie did earlier in the week, where the Aussie was doing this retracement and then fell. Um, that's kind of what I'm talking about here on the pound uh, daily. It's kind of doing this little retracement thing, and then it should leg down like this. That's what I'm looking for on the pound. What about the Swissy Daily Kangaroo Tail? Yeah, this one's interesting. Let me talk about this one. Um, first of all, I need to put my zones on the chart. So I've got a zone right here, and I've got one right there, and then I'm going to have one right here. Right about there. Now, some people are going to have one here off this support and that resistance, and that's where it's going to line up with our kangaroo tail. <coughs> um, okay, well, let's talk about this because it has triggered. All right. Is this a kangaroo tail? Is it valid? Yes. It's got all of the things the open and the close are in the bottom third of the candle, the, the long tail penetrates the zone. The next candle traded lower. Um, it's possible that this one could work out. Let's look at the weekly. Yeah. I have. A, here's the thing that I say about. Um, see this candle right here? How it's a. Uh, what's the open and the close? Is the same? Open was 96.45 and the close was 96.45. Yeah. So it's what some people call doji or whatever. Normally, when we get these with strong trends, the market usually tends to keep trending in that direction. I don't have a problem selling this one. It already triggered the sell. So remember, the low here is 96.41. So selling at 96.35 would have been fine. And look, this candle's already traded well below 96.35. It's gone about 70 pips lower than this candle. But it's back up there. And if I tend to shy away from trades that look like this because of the big blue candles here and the fact that we have this little open and close candle with the long wicks. That's usually, to me, a trend continuation. Boy, this is a tough one. Let, let's see what the four hour shows. Yeah. Mm, it's a really tough one. I really don't know what to say about this one. I, 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 I would probably I would probably stay away. Yeah, I would probably stay away. Look, if you already got in because it triggered went below the low, that's fine. But I think this one's going to get stopped out. And I think it's just because of the strong move here. I don't think it's over. Look at this candle. It closed right on the high. It's a much bigger candle than the kangaroo tail. I don't like to take kangaroo tails when the, the candle immediately prior to it is so strong. I like to see the market start to slow down and show more wick before printing the kangaroo tail, and that's not what we have here. I think this is going to go higher, and so I wouldn't take this trade. No. Um, what about... Yeah, different account for EAs, Christy, I agree. Uh, Mark says, what about the Aussie CAD four hour or one hour last kiss? Um, yeah, Mark, I think, is probably looking at this right here. I think we've got to go pretty soon, guys. I don't know how much time we have, but um, here's the box. 
And so Mark's probably talking about this move right here, yeah? Is that right, Mark? Yes, Mark, definitely email me, definitely. Mark, definitely email me about the DVD. Is this the one you're looking at, Mark? This is the Aussie CAD. Carlos went, so, yeah, so um, I would, if I were on the Aussie CAD, I would wait for it to get back up. I think the Aussie dollar and the Aussie CAD are due for a retrace, and, which would be a great opportunity to sell. So maybe the Aussie CAD is going to get up to this box right here. Again, maybe it will. It, it kind of touched it right here with this wick, and then it did a bearish candle, which is great. I mean, it worked out. It went lower. But at this stage, it's, it's inching its way back up. I kind of want to see a stronger retrace on these uh, Aussie pairs like the Aussies. CAD and the Aussie dollar. Um, pound Swiss, last chart, last chart, pound Swiss. Uh, I took the pound Swiss. Who took the pound Swiss trade? Yeah, uh, right. So the king retail and the pound Swiss. That's okay. I would hold, the, I would hold out on this one. I would hold out on this one. I think this one still has an okay chance. I would wait for today's close. Hopefully today ends up being a red candle. Because still in them being, I don't, I don't see a problem with this one. I think this one's much more likely to, to work out than I could be totally wrong, but I think it's much more likely to work out than the Swissy. Yeah. To me, this one looks better than the Swissy. So there you go. All right, guys. I'm sorry that we weren't able to go over everyone's um, charts. Um, next week we probably will. I enjoy having all of you here. It's great to see so many familiar people here. Thank you so much for your time. I hope to see you next week. Thanks, guys. We'll talk about indicators and why they stink next week. Bye, guys. Thanks a lot, Michael. Bye, Mish. See you, Stacy. See you, Christy. Bye, Palav. Thanks, Jesper. Bye, Ian. Thanks, guys. Take care. Bye.